Hello, everyone. Welcome to the part three of season four of the KEO International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium. I'm Sungun Lee from International Christian University. Today, we have two exciting talks by Sarah Finley from Pacific Lutheran University and Haiyan Zhang from Busan University of Foreign Studies. Shigeto from KEO University will introduce the first speaker. All right. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Finley. Um, Sarah and I actually took some linguistics classes together back in University of California, Santa Cruz. And that's um, unfortunate to say, but that's 20 years ago now. And our careers crossed again when we were both graduate students. I was a graduate student at UMass and Sarah was a graduate student at John Hopkins. And at that time, we had a joint workshop called Humdrum. And Sun Hoon was actually there too as a graduate student at Rutgers. Uh, one general note about Sarah's research. It is common to consider linguistics as part, part of psychology, but Sarah really does study linguistics from the general perspective of psychology and cognitive science. So it's really stimulating to hear her research. And I think today's talk is not exceptional. So we are going to hear um, testing predictions from generative phonology using artificial language learning experiments. Go ahead, Sarah. Hello. Um, okay. Um, so I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Yes. <laughs> and so. Doo -doo -doo. Oops. Sorry, somehow I um, don't know how that, you're getting a, like a backwards preview. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, um, so I just wanna say thank you for having me. Um, it's um, exciting to get to uh, see you um, and um, thank you for taking time out of your Sunday night if you're on my time zone or Monday morning if you're, or some other time zone. <laughs> um, and I also want to just mention that I'm going to be presenting some work by a former undergraduate student, Stella Wang. Um, so I just want to make sure that she's acknowledged here that uh, she's done a lot of great work. All right. Um, so when we think about what we want to do in generative uh, linguistics or generative phonology in particular, we are really interested in creating a model that can generate all and only the phonological patterns that are found or at least possible in the world's languages. And we often ask the question about assumptions or representations that we need in order to make this happen. And, but it's more than just a descriptive model. We want to be able to have some explan explanation going on too. We want to know why some patterns are possible and other patterns are not. Uh, we want to know why some patterns are frequent and other patterns are maybe less so. So we want to have explanatory power. And if we think about generative linguistics as part of cognitive science, and I just put the little cognitive science society logo and you can see linguistics is there. So we know that being a part of cognitive sci uh, science is important for phonology, phonology and linguists in general. Um, but that means that we want to think about the connection to more cognition more general and thinking about cognitively plausible theories. So what would a cognitively plausible theory look like? Well, I think that explanation um, and explanatory power are really important. So we want to have uh, any theory should have explanatory power. And we also want to think about the learnability factors and that they should be learnable under the conditions of a typical human child learner. And we also want that to be able to scale up or down with other aspects of language and cognition and cognitive development. So whether it's other aspects of linguistics like phonetics and semantics and phonology or morphology or other aspects of cognition like uh, attention and memory and perception or more general aspects of psychology, like social interaction. Um, all of these things need to be able to somehow integrate. And of course, I'm not gonna be able to address all of that today, but um, I think all of these things are important. Um, 
So in order to make this happen, we need to have linking hypotheses. Uh, linking hypotheses are things that are required to connect linguistic theories to human cognition more generally. And the talk today is uh, trying to provide a little more evidence for how artificial language learning experiments can do this. Um, one of the ways that they can do this is that they can we can manipulate our linguistic structure within a controlled setting. And we also have a very clear outcome of our, our experiments, it's learning behavior. So it's something that we can measure. So in this talk, I'll provide some arguments that artificial language learning provide a way of linking generative phonology to human cognition. And I'll provide uh, some case study experimental evidence, particularly looking at vowel harmony and exceptions in vowel harmony. And um, I will provide some more general stuff in my conclusion about these uh, experiments. So we already know a lot about um, the link between generative phonology and experimental evidence. And a lot of that comes from testing some of the assumptions related to optimality theory. And so in optimality theory, this is a theory of generative grammar where you have input output mappings and those are determined through ranked viable constraints. And there's been lots of studies that have tested a lot of these assumptions. So one of the main assumptions in optimality theory is that you need markedness constraint and that um, const, uh, interactions are governed by markedness constraints and harmonic improvement. And so there's been several studies that have shown that learners seem to prefer uh, rules that have some kind of naturalness and that can be explained in terms of markedness constraints and their preference for harmonically improving alternation. Uh, there's even been studies that looked at the transitivity assumption of constraints. So if constraint A outranks constraint B, constraint B outranks constraint C by transitivity, constraint A should outrank constraint C. Um, and that seems to be the case uh, in what learners infer. And then even more basic assumption of generative phonology is the need for phonological features. And um, we've seen that adult learners make generalizations based on how features are used for the patterns. So we already have some good evidence uh, that generative linguistics can provide this kind, these kind of linking hypotheses. Uh, so let's talk more about how we can get these evidences using artificial language learning and what that paradigm is. So often uh, this method has a lot of different names. So sometimes it's called mini language learning or artificial grammar or artificial language. And they often mean the same thing, sometimes a little bit different, but for our purposes, all of those terms work fine. And the idea is that you create a miniature version of real language and it has properties of real language, but it's pared down so that you could learn it very short in a short amount of time. So maybe you're just learning a vowel harmony alternation of one affix. Uh, and so you only need to have a few minutes or maybe a couple sessions if you need to learn the pattern. And the idea is that then you can have control over things that you just can't have in natural language settings. Uh, and those things are like frequency, you can constrain, constrain the vocabulary, you can have the training and test items. And this allows you to test a variety of things, most notably le learning. Um, and so something like, for example, comparing a complex versus a simple pattern. Um, but you can also look beyond just the learning, but also generalization. And that allows you to access representation. What did they have to be able to know in order to have learned that? You can uh, look at for biases and just generally assumptions when things are ambiguous, because in natural language, things often are ambiguous. So how do we deal with that? So while the different procedure is going to vary from experiment to experiment and from lab to lab, um, I'll be presenting mostly stuff from my own lab, so which uses some pretty similar procedures. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. We use participants mainly for a convenient sample. So they're adults and they are native or near native English speakers and often participating for course credit uh, at my university usually intro psych students. Um, but we also sometimes use Mechanical Turk to crowdsource participants there who are paid. Um, so the general procedure is you train them on this pattern. 
through a listening procedure. So you listen to words or sets of words, um, and they might be set of pairs or triads, uh, but we don't include semantics unless it's part of what we're hoping to measure um, to keep it more simple. And um, the, usually the list will have maybe just 20 or 40 pairs and then uh, repeat five or 10 times in a random order. So um, not a lot of exposure. So it's not in the terms of like thousands or millions of other uh, utterances you might hear as a child. And then after the listing, you get a two alternative force choice and we try to make them as minimally different as possible. So for example, you might get a grammatical form and an ungrammatical form or harmon harmony and a disharmony. And then the training will have, uh, the test items will have a mix of some items are old, some items are new, and some items might be uh, more, um, generalization items. So they'll be very different in a more a systematic way. So for example, maybe a novel segment that you hadn't heard, or maybe an affix that wasn't presented in the training, or the affix is in a different location. Okay, so a suffix becomes a prefix, for example. And then you can compare things. And when you have two alternative force choice, there's um, some nice things. Uh, one is that um, if you are thinking, trying to relate to optimality theory or something like that, you have clear candidates. Another thing is that you have a very clear like benchmark for learnability, which is not really like, um, you know, you know, very difficult, like hard hurdle, but it's like 50% if you were guessing versus not guessing. So if you're guessing, you should be higher than 50 or significantly higher or lower than 50%. And then you can also compare to other conditions, say you have other control conditions or con comparing the conditions to each other. Okay, so there's, uh, even though you have a relatively simple task, it can be quite complicated to find the right um, way to compare. All right. And so the patterns that I'll be training people in my experiments uh, are all vowel harmony patterns. So we, um, we use vowel harmony, which is a very common pattern in phonology. And it's one where you have vowels and they agree in some kind of feature. So maybe backness or rounding. And um, it's often involved in morphological, morphophonological alternation. So very famously like neck knock dative in Hungarian. The nice thing about vowel harmony for doing studies related to questions in generative phonology is that it's not a particularly idiosyncratic or rare so that maybe you don't even know if it exists, you know, you know it exists and you, there has a lot of really interesting features that we kind of know about. Um, um, but um, so it's very common. Um, so it's something that is well studied, but it's also something that a lot of our naive participants who don't know any linguistics don't know much about vowel harmony. So they haven't really studied the vowel harmony language. So we don't have to exclude um, very many people to prior knowledge due to that. Um, and we also know if we were trying to test uh, some of the really big questions related to generative phonology, we uh, already have a lot of evidence that this can be done. So uh, just a couple of examples from some studies looking at vowel harmony. We know that harmony is pretty easy to learn um, and it's also uh, a little bit easier to learn than disharmony. We know that harmony relate, like people learn the harmony in terms of the features. Uh, so we're sort of tapping into some of the representations that we want. Um, and we also have some evidence that perceptually or phonetically grounded patterns that also happen to be more typologically uh, common cross linguistically tend to be preferred in learners compared to ones that are type more typologically rare and also phonetically ungrounded. So those are all some good things um, that we, we know. Um, but we also have more specific predictions that we could potentially test. So I'm gonna talk about one related to exceptions. And for the purposes of this study and um, how we're talking about this, uh, we're mostly talking about sort of the difference in um, affixes, whether, uh, whether they undergo or not. So a language with exceptions in vowel harmony would have some affixes undergo harmony and others not. Um, and so uh, in some work that I done 
uh, a while back, I looked at a lot of different of different types of these exceptions. And one of the things that I had found was that it seemed like, for the most part, exceptions tended to be local in the sense that if you have a non-participating or not undergoing morphine, it doesn't just completely skip over. It it will create a new new do, new spreading domain in those um, spread. So you have like in a Hungarian uh, the gain uh, is doesn't alternate with the stem, um, and then the following affix after it um, agrees uh, with the with that one as opposed to the stem. Um, and so many of the languages that I looked at all seem to have this pattern. Um, and it also fell through uh, with uh, an OT analysis that seemed to work better and make that prediction as well. So that might say something about whether or not uh, participants or just general learners are going to uh, infer, make that assumption about exceptions in null harmony. So um, you might want to test that. Um, and there are other reasons beyond just the data that I um, that we found uh, cross linguistically. There may be um, we've seen in other artificial language learning experiments locality biases. So biases, uh, particularly in learning continent harmony systems. Um, other studies looking at the interaction of the locality and directionality in harmony found a bias towards locality. And when in another study that I did, we looked at non-participating vowels, so as opposed to affixes, and there are two main types, opaque and transparent. And opaque vowels are sort of more local in the sense that they block um, spreading and start a new domain, while transparent vowels kind of skip over that, and they're often considered to be more long distance. And participants in that experiment were, more, were better at learning the opaque compared to the transparent. And just also when we look at the typology as well as many of the optimality theoretic analyses of exceptions all seem to prefer locality. So that would might suggest that you would think that. Um, however, there are some reasons to think maybe there wouldn't be a bias or the bias would even go in the other direction. So um, if you're thinking about harmony being controlled by the stem, so you have a stem vowel and then it tells what affix is gonna be. So you can imagine the, the stem is bold. And um, so uh, kipe are front vowels. And then, um, so it might decide that may is better because it's the same as a stem as opposed to mo, which is the same as the one that's close to it. So you might think of like a really, strong stem control bias could um, have that. And if we also think that like maybe if participants are more likely to hear the, the more simple word, uh, you're in, you learn the more simple word like kipe me, um, that's more similar. Kipe me is more similar to kipe go me than um, kipe go mo. So you might prefer um, the long distance one there. Uh, you may even, or maybe they don't really know and they just, um, uh, assume it's kind of invisible or inert and just sort of uh, don't really um, don't really treat it in the same way. Um, we also uh, have some evidence that uh, there are counterexamples to that general trend of it locality. And it's important that like maybe all of the languages that we looked at like way back when uh, were in a complete set and um, and that the we, the richer we may need a better typology of exceptions to make um, stronger claims. So it may not actually be correct. Um, so it's important to address that. Okay. Another prediction that we might think could happen with exceptions is that we might show even in non-alternating affixes a bias towards harmony. And we can actually show this prediction in optimality theory, but more easily in harmonic grammar, where you, um, which would predict a non-alternating affect should be preferred in harmonic context. So let's say you have a non-alternating affix go as a suffix. Um, and if we look at the harmony score, um, it will be bigger. Um, and, the, um, and the difference between the, uh, it'll be bigger um, when it's in a harmonic context than when it's in a disharmonic context. And the difference between the winner and loser will also be bigger in the 
harmonic contact. So you can kind of see that in the first tableau, you have Beime, which is a front foul stem, um, and then you have the affix, and you have the high ranked ident constraint for Go. Um, so it's violated even in the harmony case. So you sacrifice harmony to have this non alternating affix, uh, which is a high ident. But I agree, generally outranks ident. Um, so it, it would win. Uh, so you have harmony in the language. But uh, the non alternating affix still wins because of the high rank constraint. Um, but when you have a backfill sum, uh, harmony is vacuously satisfied. So um, the harmonic uh, harmony and non alternation um, is the best. Um, and that wins. And so you can see that has a harmony score of zero compared to a harmony score of negative five. And um, the difference. Um, zero and negative 16 is bigger than negative five. So, and 11. So if you were um, going to add some gradients in here, uh, like a maxent model or something like that, you might find that um, the probability of selecting Bomo Go is slightly higher than the probability of selecting Baby Go. Um, and that's something that you could definitely test. And so that's what um, I did in this study. Um, where we trained English speakers on this background vowel harmony pattern that had exceptions. So there were harmonic stems, um, but there were alternating one alternating suffix that was alternating between may and mo, and then non-alternating suffix that was always go, regardless of the stem vowel. And the way that participants learned this uh, was through triads. So you had stem vowels, um, like tunu, and then they would hear stem plus suffix like tunu mo, and then stem plus suffix uh, tunu go. And uh, the order was counterbalanced. So sometimes people heard um, the non alternating second, and sometimes people heard uh, the non alternating third. Um, so you had front vowel stems and back vowel stems. Um, so you got to see the alternation and the non alternation. And so they um, were given these. Um, 24 of these different triads and um, five times in the random order. And then they got a two alternative force test, force choice test. And this was compared to a control condition. The control condition basically just were asked to choose which one they preferred um, without any training at all. Okay. Um, and so we had old stem items. The old stem items were ones that heard in the training set um, and included the non alternating and alternating affixes. Um, the new go items were the non-alternating and they, um, uh, yeah, so they were, uh, so the correct answer would always be go regardless of whether the stem was front or back. And the new may mo items were always um, the alternating ones. So it would be correct depending on the stem now. And then we had these agglutinative items, old and new for the stem was either part of the training or novel. And then we concatenated through splicing uh, get, go and may or mo uh, onto that. So you would hear like ki pe go may, which is the stem control or ki pe go mo, which is the local version. We counted the local one as correct. Okay, um, so here are results. So you can see in the first three pairs of bars, they learned the harmony pattern in the alternating and non alternating and non-alternating affixes, but we don't see much of a bias uh, towards locality. If anything, it's a bias towards the stem control, even in the control, but these are not statistically significant from chance or from the control. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so let's look at what's going on in the Go affixes to test for our harmony bias. So we pull those apart so that you have new uh, new go items with, with new go f were when the stem vowel was front and new go b was when the stem vowel was back and you can see that both of them were different from the control but the new go back items were higher so they were more likely to select the go um, when the stem vowel was back so that's a, a harmony bias there okay so what was going on with the locality well one possibility that I was worried about was that maybe it's because of this way we spliced them all together and that might have just sounded weird um, and somehow disproportionately weird for the the local items. Um, so we re-recorded re the stimuli and re-ran the study um, 
and replicate it. And you can see in those final two bars um, there, um, old glue and new glue items were at 50%, pretty much exactly. <laughs> so no bias there. Um, but um, if you look at the uh, second and third blue bar, um, you have new go F and new go B, you see that difference, um, the locality bias was, was I'm not sorry, the harmony bias was replicated. Um, so we didn't um, show any bias towards locality and that maybe posed a question about the theory. And I think that's a good thing because I think it's important to have evidence um, to know when to look at things again. Um, we'll talk about that some more. Um, so what I've shown in this first ex set of experiments is that um, that we have uh, multiple predictions related to exceptions and harmony from generative grammar. And we see the bias towards harmony and exceptions does hold. And so that supports our model of harmony that allows for some gradients. We also found a predictive bias for exceptions was not in present in this. It could be an issue of the method for sure. And um, that's something to look into, um, but it could also be an issue of the theory. And so I think it's important um, to address those and think about that. Okay. So another um, prediction that you might find from generative phonology comes from um, Bakovich's dissertation where he looked at a Greek constraints for harmony. And agree constraints are pretty simple. Um, and they say just agree with um, the same feature value. And these, um, he specifically argues in his dissertation about the non-directionality of this constraint. So there is no proposed direction. You have, you can derive directionality from constraints on affixation or mark as constraints or other, other components like that. Um, but it's not inherent in the harmony constraint. So that makes a prediction that all else being equal, learners should propose, should prefer to infer non-directionality if, if that's the case. Um, and you can kind of see how this prediction falls out with this toy tableau here. Um, you have, if you have an input with two vowels that disagree in rounding, the there's two options. You could spread one way um, and make them both unround, or you can spread the other way and make them both round. Um, they both will have one violation of ident. So the deciding factor um, in this case is on markedness constraints on rounding. So um, if the if rounded vowels are more marked, you would spread um, to where it's uh, to where the it's more it's less marked to have the round vowel. Um, so have a, the direction could be determined that way. So in my dissertation many moons ago, uh, we looked at this question um, and we trained participants on a language that was either stem to suffix or stem to prefix, and then tested on both directions to see what inference that they made about the directionality. So for example, if you were in the prefix training condition, you would hear something like mi be, mi be me, mi be me, go mo, mu go mo. Uh, and if you were in the suffix training condition, you'd hear be me, be me me, go mo, go mo mu. And then you were tested on all the affixes. So you would be able to see, did you generalize to novel prefixes? Did you generalize um, to novel suffixes from hearing one or the other? And what you can see is um, in the suffix training and prefix training conditions, both of them learn the harmony pattern and they also generalize greater than the control. So if you were trained on suffixes, you generalize to prefixes. And if you trained on prefixes, you generalize to suffixes. And there were no difference in generalization across the two conditions. So that suggests that uh, participants learned a non-directional rule. So now we kind of have some ideas about how people are behaving with learning exceptions and learning directionality. So one of uh, my students, Stella, um, she was really interested in what whether there would be any kind of interaction between the two. Um, so the question she asked in her research uh, was, do, what inferences do learners make about directionality if you're exposed to exceptions? Because the idea is, uh, if some um, ones are exceptions, is that um, constraining direction, the direction or not? So her experiment had a two by two um, between subjects. Um, we're alternating and non-alternating and prefix and suffix. Um, for the sake of time, uh, unless um, 
somehow I'm going way faster than I think. Um, we'll only be discussing the prefix and suffix conditions, uh, but I'm happy to talk about the others. Um, so um, prefix only and suffix only condition, basically you only hear a prefix, but one of them is alternating and the other is non-alternating. So in prefix only, you hear deke, me deke, go deke, bono, mobomo, gobomo, nepe, uh, me nepe, go nepe. And suffix only, it would be the same, but you, know, you have a suffix. Um, one is alternating and the other is not. Deke, deke me, deke go, for example. Um, and then the alternate only conditions, um, you would hear uh, alternating affix as a suffix and non-alternating as a prefix and vice versa. Um, oh my God. Sorry, somebody is calling me in the middle of this talk, which is not fun. I did not do not disturb on my phone. Sorry. Um, okay, and yes. Um, so, um, so they got these, um, and then they had all four um, four types of test items, um, which um, were two alternative force choice, um, and every participant got the same regardless of the training condition. So uh, may new prefix is a new stem, but uh, as a the alter may may versus mo uh, as a prefix. So may te day versus mo te day. Go new prefix is the same, um, but it's the non um, alternating affix. Um, so gay te day versus go te day, and go te day would be correct because that's the non alternating form. New may suff suffix is the alternating affix may versus mo. Um, First. And we always counterbalance everything so that half of the time the correct one is first and the other half the not correct one is first. Okay, so here are the results for the prefix and suffix only condition. Um, and if you look at the prefix only, um, is the, um, the, the um, solid bars, these are the go, so the non-alternating. And you see that they're pretty high for all of the condition. So that suggests that uh, they did generalize and learn the behavior of the non-alternating affix, which is pretty easy. It's always go. Um, but in the case of the alternating affix, in the suffix only condition, they did pretty good um, for both. So they learned the suffix and generalized alternating to the prefix. But in the prefix condition, they didn't really do very well um, on alter generalizing to the suffix. Um, um, but when we looked at the interaction, it wasn't significant. However, um, we'll show you that some that might be because of some of the more nitty gritty um, within that, and particularly because we wanna we didn't separate. We kept all of the stems the same, so whether it was front or back, and that actually makes a difference um, because we've seen with the harmony bias. So we see in the front vowel when we look at the compare front vowel versus back vowels in the non-alternating affixes. Uh, we still see that there is a preference for uh, the non-alternating affix um, in uh, back vowel stems. And um, this is especially true for uh, the suffix items. Okay, so they um, seem to be more preferring harmony when it's uh, a suffix. Um, and then we also looked at the um, front versus back vowel stems for the alternating affixes. And what you see here is um, a pretty good difference between the prefix only and suffix only conditions. So in the suffix only conditions, there really isn't a bias, which there shouldn't be. There's no predicted bias for front or back vowels um, in the alternating affix for harmony. But um, the prefix only conditions there does seem to be. And in fact, um, for both the prefixes and the suffixes for when the stem vowel is front, um, and those are the checkered bars, uh, the second checkered bar and the last checkered bar. You don't see um, them select, selecting the harmony, harmonic option at a rate higher than chance uh, when the stem vowels front. So that suggests that they're actually in the prefix condition treating the, um, the stem vowel as, uh, or sorry, treating that not alternating affix as um, a, a non-alternating affix. So even though they were trained on the prefix condition um, with an alternating affix. Um, when they got both together, it seemed like they treated it like a, more like a non-alternating affix. Um, so what can we say from this study? Um, we asked the question of like, do learners infer non-alternating affixes as exceptions or more directionally constrained? 
And it does seem that they assume that a non-alternating affix is non-alternating when it moves around. So go as a prefix and go as a suffix, both non-alternating. Um, but it does seem that the harmony bias for these is bigger when it's a suffix. Um, when participants are exposed to prefixes only, and one is alternating and one is not, they really have trouble learning the alternating affix. Um, and so they infer both seem to be non-alternating and they just generalize that to suffixes. Uh, when you're exposed to suffixes, both as alternating and alternating, that's a much easier situation for learners. So they um, assume that the alternating affix is alternating in both prefix and suffix contexts, and they assume the same for the non-alternating. Um, so uh, I've just presented a couple experiments looking at artificial grammar learning, testing predictions that makes sense um, from generative approaches. Um, so you can see that there are many ways in which generative phonology can make predictions that are actually have testable hypotheses in artificial language learning. And that we've seen that like not all of those cases come out exactly perfectly clear all the time, but I think that's important. And, and it's still helpful in moving the theory forward because you always want to have converging evidence and you want to have external evidence as we're talking about cognitively plausible models of, of phonology. And when results are not in line, it can help us uh, to understand when it is that we want to go back and take a better look, a closer look at our theory and the data that's driving this theory. Um, well, do we need better evidence? Um, and so I think that's really important. It also poses uh, nature of the categorical nature of the target language and the languages we learn. As I mentioned, the harmony bias only works if you assume um, some amount of gradients um, in your representation is allowed. And so that does um, pose that question there. Um, and I think as we keep doing more and more of these experiments, we get better at our methods and our techniques. And that is going to allow us to uh, talk about questions that are really, really strongly rooted in generative phonology and much more deeper and maybe more nuanced. And I think that's important uh, as we make these connections to linguistic theory. So this is um, to conclude now. Um, I've shown you hopefully and convinced everybody that generative phonology has lots and lots of predictions that can readily be tested using artificial language learning paradigms. Some may be very specific, like locality of exceptions, very nuanced. Others may be more general, like something like a natural or simplicity bias, um, and both are fine. Um, and today I specifically talked to you about interaction of exceptions and directionality. And we see bias towards harmony in non-alternating affixes. Um, and that seems to be less um, if exposed to alternations or non-alternations in prefixes. And the bias towards alternation in suffixes over prefixes. And But that bias only emerged when we had that interaction with the non-alternating affixes. Um, so in the per study with just alternating affixes, um, there wasn't really any bias. Um, and we found no bias for locality and exceptions, which is a sign that uh, we want to rethink maybe some of the assumptions that we make in our theory or in our data and the predictions that those make. Um, so that is all I have. I hope I have no idea if I'm on time or not. So, um, and um, yes. Um, so thank you everybody uh, for being here. And um, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, great, um, great talk. Uh, so now we have some uh, questions, and the first question uh, come from uh, Yong Ah Do, uh, Hong Kong University. You are muted. I'm muted. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hi. Thanks a lot for the talk. It's really interesting. So the way that you interpreted the result is that people basically treated the two types of the affixes differently. There is a one type which is alternating and another type which is not alternating. Is there any chance that we can see an alternative way saying that 
there is more global generalization that people saw there is an A, I think proportionally it's a 25% in your experiment, and then O simply appears 75% without separating the two affixes as an independent links. So if we interpret it that way, and if that is something going on in people's mind, will that cause any issues in the interpretation that you presented? Um, so yeah, you can actually test for that. Um, and that, so you can see, oh, like if they are completely probability matching, then you would expect them participants to choose the O about 75% of the time, um, regardless. Um, and that, and that doesn't really happen. Um, in fact, um, I was looking, I'm not, at, I was looking at the replication data, uh, and in fact, some people um, were very categorical um, and always selected O, like the majority. So like they overgeneralized. And some people were, and so you, ha you had like different types of people making different inferences. And so I definitely, um, but, I, but I never found anything where, I mean, where it was like exactly like that, where it always seemed to match. So yeah, you have some people who are like, oh, har harmony all the time. And so they would just apply harmony 100% of the time. And you have some people who uh, match completely. Um, and um, um, like exactly what they heard in, um, and, and fit exactly the affixes. Um, and you had some people who appeared to be more random. Um, but you don't... Um, but I didn't really see anything like what you would be suggesting. So I don't know, but that's definitely a possibility that like we would say, oh, 75% of the time. Um, but then you would see the same level. Um, yeah. And it's um, if you just looked at like how many it's like if you coded the results as like how what percent of the time are they selecting? O, um, you would expect 75% across all conditions. And that's that does not happen. Um, yeah, it's just the way we coded it. But if we coded it differently, um, you wouldn't see that. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question okay. way too long. So if it's not like a phonologically well-conditioned distribution, there is no chance that people actually saw this as a like a variation learning between N and O, I guess, because there is no way to interpret like the one pattern as a minority for any kind of a phonological reason here, right? Well, they're, they're not, so that's the thing is that you could, you, we only had, um, they were all like, everything happened half the time. So like, it wasn't like, so there was always May and Mo. So, I mean, so I think if you were, um, so I think that was like, if you just had it ending in, oh, 75% of the time, like, so yeah, you could do a control condition like that and see and then um, uh dina Bearhenny had run a similar mm -hmm. like a like to what you're saying where it was like um like 60 percent of the time or something it was disharmonic harmonic and then the other percent it was harmonic and they found um something similar to what you're saying so i think um because we had it like affix condition the way we did where it was like where they there wasn't there was variability in what the affixes were doing but not a variability within the affix. So like, it wasn't like this affix apply, applies harmony 50% of the time and this affix alternates 50% of the time. So like, that's another question. And then that's not, but that's not, we were like sort of having categorical within there. So like that would be a different prediction. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, because of the time, uh, let's uh, try to uh, uh, wrap up this session and then go to the breakout room for further uh, discussion. Uh, thank you uh, again. Let's thank uh, uh, Sarah. Uh, yes, and the uh, recording will stop now. <laughs>